this is the publisher's preface to the dresden edition of the works of robert g ingersoll published as a twelve volume set in nineteen hundred the eulogies which follow are taken from the latter half of volume twelve entitled miscellany this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read for you by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana publishers preface in presenting to the public this edition of the late robert g ingersoll's works it has been the aim of the publisher to make it worthy of the author and a pleasure to his friends and admirers no one can be more conscious than he of the magnitude of the task undertaken or more keenly feel how far short it must fall of adequate accomplishment when it is remembered that countless utterances of the author were never caught from his eloquent lips it is matter for congratulation that so much has been preserved the authorized addresses arguments and articles that have already appeared in print and passed the review of the author's more or less careful inspection will be readily recognized as accurate and complete but in this latest and fullest compilation are many emanations from his heart and brain that have never had his scrutiny were not revised by him and that yet by general judgment should not be lost to the world these unedited sundries consist of fragments of speeches and incompleted articles discovered among the author's literary remains and for unknown reasons left in more or less unfinished form it has been the publisher's ambition to gather these fugitive pieces and place them in this edition by the side of the saved treasures whether the work has been well or ill done a generous public must decide while the sole responsibility must rest with as it has been assumed by the publisher in carrying out the design of the present edition the publisher gratefully acknowledges the assistance of mr ingersoll's family who have freely placed at his disposal many papers inscriptions monographs memoranda and pages of valuable material recognition is also here made of the kind courtesy of the press and of publishers of magazines who have generously permitted the publication of articles originally written for them finally the publisher gives his thanks to all the devoted friends of the author who in many ways by suggestion and unselfish labor have aided in getting out this work of these none have been more unremitting in service and to none is the publisher more indebted than to mr i newton baker mr ingersoll's former private secretary to dr edgar c beale and to mr george e macdonald for the fine table of contents and the very valuable index to this edition c p farrell new york july nineteen hundred end of publisher's preface Section 1 of Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Edward Kirkby, Warwick, England. Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. Section 1. A tribute to George Jacob Holyoke. Two articles have recently appeared attacking the motives of George Jacob Holyoke. He is spoken of as a man governed by a desire to please the rich and powerful, as one afraid of public opinion, and who in the perilous hour denies or conceals his convictions. In these attacks there is not one word of truth. They are based upon mistakes and misconceptions. There is not in this world a nobler, braver man. In England he has done more for the great cause of intellectual liberty than any other man of this generation. He has done more for the poor, for the children of toil, for the homeless and wretched than any other living man. He has attacked all abuses, all tyranny, and all forms of hypocrisy. His weapons have been reason, logic, facts, kindness and above all example he has lived his creed he has won the admiration and respect of his bitterest antagonists he has the simplicity of childhood 
the enthusiasm of youth and the wisdom of age he is not abusive but he is clear and conclusive he is intense without violence firm without anger he has the strength of perfect kindness he does not hate he pities he does not attack men and women but dogmas and creeds and he does not attack them to get the better of people but to enable people to get the better of them he gives the light he has he shares his intellectual wealth with the orthodox poor he assists without insulting guides without arrogance and enlightens without outrage besides he is eminent for the exercise of plain common sense he knows that there are wrongs besides those born of superstition that people are not necessarily happy because they have renounced the thirty-nine articles and that the priest is not the only enemy of mankind he has for forty years been preaching and practising industry economy self-reliance and kindness he has done all within his power to give the working man a better home better food better wages and better opportunities for the education of his children he has demonstrated the success of cooperation of intelligent combination for the common good as a rule his methods have been perfectly legal in some instances he has knowingly violated the law and did so with the intention to take the consequences he would neither ask nor accept a pardon because to receive a pardon carries with it the implied promise to keep the law and an admission that you were in the wrong he would not agree to desist from doing what he believed ought to be done neither would he stain his past to brighten his future nor imprison his soul to free his body he has that happy mingling of gentleness and firmness found only in the highest type of moral heroes he is an absolutely just man and will never do an act that he would condemn in another he admits that the most bigoted churchman has a perfect right to express his opinions not only but that he must be met with argument couched in kind and candid terms mr holyoke is not only the enemy of a theological hierarchy but he is also opposed to mental mobs he will not use the bludgeon of epithet perfect fairness is regarded by many as weakness some people have altogether more confidence in their beliefs than in their own arguments they resort to assertion if what they assert be denied the debate becomes a question of veracity on both sides of most questions there are plenty of persons who imagine that logic dwells only in adjectives and that to speak kindly of an opponent is a virtual surrender mr holyoke attacks the church because it has been is and ever will be the enemy of mental freedom but he does not wish to deprive the church even of its freedom to express its opinion against freedom he is true to his own creed knowing that when we have freedom we can take care of all its enemies in one of the articles to which i have referred it is charged that mr holyoke refused to sign a petition for the pardon of persons convicted of blasphemy if this is true he undoubtedly had a reason satisfactory to himself you will find that his action or his refusal to act rests upon a principle that he would not violate in his own behalf why should we suspect the motives of this man who has given his life for the good of others 
i know of no one who is his mental or moral superior he is the most disinterested of men his name is a synonym of candour he is a natural logician an intellectual marksman like an unerring arrow his thought flies to the heart and centre he is governed by principle and makes no exception in his own favour he is intellectually honest he shows you the cracks and flaws in his own wares he calls attention to the open joints and to the weakest links he does not want a victory for himself but for truth he wishes to expose and oppose not men but error he is blessed with that cloudless mental vision that appearances cannot deceive that interest cannot darken and that even ingratitude cannot blur friends cannot induce and enemies cannot drive this man to do an act that his heart and brain would not applaud that such a character was formed without the aid of the church without the hope of harp or fear of flame is a demonstration against the necessity of superstition whoever is opposed to mental bondage to the shackles wrought by cruelty and worn by fear should be the friend of this heroic and unselfish man i know something of his life something of what he has suffered of what he has accomplished for his fellow-men he has been maligned imprisoned and impoverished he bore the heat and burden of the unregarded day and remembered the misery of the many for years his only recompense was ingratitude at last he was understood he was recognized as an earnest honest gifted generous sterling man loving his country sympathizing with the poor honoring the useful and holding in supreme abhorrence tyranny and falsehood in all their forms the idea that this man could for a moment be controlled by any selfish motive by the hope of preferment by the fear of losing a supposed annuity is simply absurd the authors of these attacks are not acquainted with mr holyoke whoever dislikes him does not know him read his trial of theism his history of cooperation in england if you wish to know his heart to discover the motives of his life the depth and tenderness of his sympathy the nobleness of his nature the subtlety of his thought the beauty of his spirit the force and volume of his brain the extent of his information his candour his kindness his genius and the perfect integrity of his stainless soul there is no man for whom i have greater respect greater reverence greater love than george jacob holyoke end of section one a tribute to george jacob holyoke august eighth eighteen eighty three Recording by Edward Kirkby, Warwick, England. Section 2 of Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll Section 2 At the Grave of Benjamin W. Parker This was the first tribute ever delivered by Colonel Ingersoll at a grave. Mr. Parker himself was an agnostic, was the father of Mrs. Ingersoll, and was always a devoted friend and admirer of the Colonel, even before the latter's marriage with his daughter. Peoria, Illinois, May 24, 1876 friends and neighbors to fulfill a promise made many years ago i wish to say a word 
he whom we are about to lay in the earth was gentle kind and loving in his life he was ambitious only to live with those he loved he was hospitable generous and sincere he loved his friends and the friends of his friends he returned good for good he lived the life of a child and died without leaving in the memory of his family the record of an unkind act without assurance and without fear we give him back to nature the source and mother of us all with morn with noon with night with changing clouds and changeless stars with grass and trees and birds with leaf and bud with flower and blossoming vine with all the sweet influences of nature we leave our dead husband father friend farewell end of section two Section 3 of Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. Section number 3. A tribute to Eben C. Ingersoll, Washington, D.C., May 31st, 1879. Footnote to a tribute to Eben C. Ingersoll. The funeral of the Honorable E.C. Ingersoll took place yesterday afternoon at four o'clock from his late residence, 1403 K Street the only ceremony at the house other than the viewing of the remains was a most affecting pathetic and touching address by colonel robert g ingersoll brother of the deceased not only the speaker but every one of his hearers were deeply affected when he began to read his eloquent characterization of the dead man his eyes at once filled with tears he tried to hide them, but he could not do it, and finally he bowed his head upon the dead man's coffin in uncontrollable grief. It was only after some delay and the greatest efforts at self-mastery that Colonel Ingersoll was able to finish reading his address. When he had ceased speaking, the members of the bereaved family approached the casket and looked upon the form which it contained for the last time the scene was heart-rending the devotion of all connected with the household excited the sympathy of all and there was not a dry eye to be seen the pallbearers senator william b allison senator james g blaine senator david davis senator daniel w voorhees representative james a garfield senator a s paddock representative thomas q boyd of illinois the honorable ward h lerman ex-congressman jerry wilson and representative adelaide e stevenson of illinois then bore the remains to the hearse and the lengthy cortege proceeded to the oak hill cemetery where the remains were interred in the presence of the family and friends without further ceremony national republican washington d c june three eighteen seventy nine A tribute to Eben C. Ingersoll. Dear friends, 
I am going to do that which the dead oft promised he would do for me. The loved and loving brother, husband, father, friend, died where manhood's morning almost touches noon, and while the shadows were still falling toward the west. He had not passed on life's highway the stone that marks the highest point, but, being weary for a moment, he lay down by the wayside, and using his burden for a pillow, fell into that dreamless sleep that kisses down his eyelids still. While yet in love with life, and raptured with the world, he passed to silence and pathetic dust. Yet, after all, it may be best, just in the happiest, sunniest hour of all the voyage, while eager winds are kissing every sail, to dash against the unseen rock, and in an instant hear the billows roar above a sunken ship. For whether in mid-sea, or among the breakers of the farther shore, a wreck at last must mark the end of each and all. And every life, no matter if its every hour is rich with love, and every moment jeweled with a joy, will, at its close, become a tragedy as sad and deep and dark as can be woven of the warp and woof of mystery and death. This brave and tender man in every storm of life was oak and rock, but in the sunshine he was vine and flower. He was the friend of all heroic souls. He climbed the heights and left all superstitions far below, while on his forehead fell the golden dawning of the grander day. He loved the beautiful and was with color, form, and music touched to tears he sided with the weak the poor and wronged and lovingly gave alms with loyal heart and with the purest hands he faithfully discharged all public trusts he was a worshipper of liberty the friend of the oppressed a thousand times i have heard him quote these words for justice all place a temple, and all season summer. He believed that happiness is the only good, reason the only torch, justice the only worship, humanity the only religion, and love the only priest. He added to the sum of human joy, and were everyone to whom he did some loving service to bring a blossom to his grave, he would sleep tonight beneath a wilderness of flowers. Life is a narrow veil between the cold and barren peaks of two eternities. We strive in vain to look beyond the heights. We cry aloud, and the only answer is the echo of our wailing cry. From the voiceless lips of the unreplying dead there comes no word. But in the night of death, hope sees a star, and listening, love can hear the rustle of a wing. He who sleeps here, when dying, mistaking the approach of death for the return of health, whispered with his latest breath, I am better now. Let us believe, in spite of doubts and dogmas, of fears and tears, that these dear words are true of all the countless dead. The record of a generous life runs like a vine around the memory of our dead, and every sweet, unselfish act is now a perfumed flower. 
and now to you who have been chosen from among the many men he loved to do the last sad office for the dead we give his sacred dust speech cannot contain our love there was there is no gentler stronger manlier man end of section three a tribute to eben c ingersoll section four of eulogies by colonel robert g ingersoll this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org eulogies by colonel robert g ingersoll section four a tribute to the reverend alexander clark washington d c july thirteenth eighteen seventy nine upon the grave of the reverend alexander clark i wish to place one flower utterly destitute of cold dogmatic pride that often passes for the love of god without the arrogance of the elect simple free and kind this earnest man made me his friend by being mine i forgot that he was a christian and he seemed to forget that i was not while each remembered that the other was at least a man. Frank, candid, and sincere, he practiced what he preached, and looked with the holy eyes of charity upon the failings and mistakes of men. He believed in the power of kindness, and spanned with divine sympathy the hideous gulf that separates the fallen from the pure. Giving freely to others the rights that he claimed for himself, it never occurred to him that his God hated a brave and honest unbeliever. He remembered that even an infidel had rights that love respects, that hatred has no saving power, and that in order to be a Christian it is not necessary to become less than a human being. He knew that no one can be maligned into kindness, that epithets cannot convince, that curses are not arguments, and that the finger of scorn never points towards heaven with the generosity of an honest man he accorded to all the fullest liberty of thought knowing as he did that in the realm of mind a chain is but a curse for this man i felt the greatest possible regard in spite of the taunts and jeers of his brethren he publicly proclaimed that he would treat infidels with fairness and respect that he would endeavor to convince them by argument and win them with love he insisted that the god he worshipped loved the well-being even of an atheist in this grand position he stood almost alone tender just and loving where others were harsh vindictive and cruel he challenged the admiration of every honest man a few more such clergymen might drive calumny from the lips of faith and render the pulpit worthy of esteem the heartiness and kindness with which this generous man treated me can never be excelled. He admitted that I had not lost, and could not lose, a single right by the expression of my honest thought. Neither did he believe that a servant could win the respect of a generous master by persecuting and maligning those whom the master would willingly forgive. While this good man was living, his brethren blamed him for having treated me with fairness. But, I trust, now that he has left the shore touched by the mysterious sea that never yet has borne on any wave the image of a homeward sail, this crime will be forgiven him by those who still remain to preach the love of God. His sympathies were not confined within the prison of a creed, but ran out and over the walls like vines, hiding cruel rocks and rusted bars with leaf and flower. He could not echo with his heart the fiendish sentence of eternal fire. In spite of book and creed, he read, between the lines, the words of tenderness and love with promises for all the world. Above, beyond the dogmas of his church, humane even to the verge of heresy, causing some to doubt his love of God because he failed to hate his unbelieving fellow men, he labored for the welfare of mankind and to his work gave up his life with all his heart. 
End of section 4section five of eulogies by colonel robert g ingersoll this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen eulogies by colonel robert g ingersoll section five at a child's grave washington d c january eighth eighteen eighty two my friends i know how vain it is to gild a grief with words and yet i wish to take from every grave its fear here in this world where life and death are equal kings all should be brave enough to meet what all the dead have met the future has been filled with fear stained and polluted by the heartless past from the wondrous tree of life the buds and blossoms fall with ripened fruit and in the common bed of earth patriarchs and babes sleep side by side why should we fear that which will come to all that is we cannot tell we do not know which is the greater blessing life or death we cannot say that death is not a good we do not know whether the grave is the end of this life or the door of another or whether the night here is not somewhere else a dawn neither can we tell which is the more fortunate the child dying in its mother's arms before its lips have learned to form a word or he who journeys all the length of life's uneven road painfully taking the last slow steps with staff and crutch every cradle asks us whence and every coffin whither the poor barbarian weeping above his dead can answer these questions just as well as the robed priest of the most authentic creed the tearful ignorance of the one is as consoling as the learned and unmeaning words of the other no man standing where the horizon of a life has touched a grave has any right to prophesy a future filled with pain and tears may be that death gives all there is of worth to life if those we press and strain within our arms could never die perhaps that love would wither from the earth may be this common fate treads from out the paths between our hearts the weeds of selfishness and hate and i had rather live and love where death is king than have eternal life where love is not another life is not unless we know and love again the ones who love us here they who stand with breaking hearts around this little grave need have no fear the larger and the nobler faith in all that is and is to be tells us that death even at its worst is only perfect rest we know that through the common wants of life the needs and duties of each hour their grief will lessen day by day until at last this grave will be to them a place of rest and peace almost of joy there is for them this consolation the dead do not suffer if they live again their lives will surely be as good as ours we have no fear we are all children of the same mother and the same fate awaits us all we too have our religion and it is this help for the living hope for the dead end of section five section six of eulogies by colonel robert g ingersoll this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox org. Recording by Kathleen Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll Section six A Tribute to John G. Mills Washington DC April fifteenth, eighteen eighty three My friends, again we are face to face with the great mystery that shrouds this world. We question, but there is no reply out on the wide waste seas there drifts no spar over the desert of death the sphinx gazes for ever but never speaks in the very may of life another heart has ceased to beat night has fallen upon noon but he lived he loved he was loved wife and children pressed their kisses on his lips this is enough the longest life contains no more this fills the vase of joy he who lies here clothed with the perfect peace of death 
was a kind and loving husband a good father a generous neighbor an honest man and these words build a monument of glory above the humblest grave he was always a child sincere and frank as full of hope as spring he divided all time into to-day and to-morrow to-morrow was without a cloud and of to-morrow he borrowed sunshine for to-day he was my friend he will remain so the living oft become estranged the dead are true he was not a christian in the eden of his hope there did not crawl and coil the serpent of eternal pain in many languages he sought the thoughts of men and for himself he solved the problems of the world he accepted the philosophy of auguste Omp. humanity was his god the human race was his supreme being in that supreme being he put his trust he believed that we are indebted for what we enjoy to the labor the self-denial the heroism of the human race and that as we have plucked the fruit of what others planted we in thankfulness should plant for others yet to be with him immortality was the eternal consequences of his own acts he believed that every pure thought every disinterested deed hastens the harvest of universal good this is a religion that enriches poverty that enables us to bear the sorrows of the saddest life that peoples even solitude with the happy millions yet to live a religion born not of selfishness and fear but of love of gratitude and hope a religion that digs wells to slake the thirst of others and gladly bears the burdens of the unborn but in the presence of death how beliefs and dogmas wither and decay how loving words and deeds burst into blossom pluck from the tree of any life these flowers and there remain but the barren thorns of bigotry and creed all wish for happiness beyond this life all hope to meet again the loved and lost in every heart there grows the sacred flower immortality is a word that hope through all the ages has been whispering to love the miracle of thought we cannot understand the mystery of life and death we cannot comprehend this chaos called the world has never been explained the golden bridge of life from gloom emerges and on shadow rests beyond this we do not know fate is speechless destiny is dumb and the secret of the future has never been told we love we wait we hope the more we love the more we fear upon the tenderest heart the deepest shadows fall all paths whether filled with thorns or flowers end here here success and failure are the same the rag of wretchedness and the purple robe of power all difference and distinction lose in this democracy of death character survives goodness lives love is immortal and yet to all a time may come when the fevered lips of life will long for the cool delicious kiss of death when tired of the dust and glare of day we all shall hear with joy the rustling garments of the night what can we say of death what can we say of the dead where they have gone reason cannot go and from thence revelation has not come but let us believe that over the cradle nature bends and smiles and lovingly above the dead in benediction holds her outstretched hands end of section six section seven of eulogies by colonel robert g ingersoll this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox recording by kathleen eulogies by colonel robert g ingersoll section seven a tribute to elijah wright new york december nineteenth eighteen eighty five another hero has fallen asleep one who enriched the world with an honest life elijah wright was one of the titans who attacked the monsters the gods of his time one of the few whose confidence in liberty was never shaken and who with undimmed eyes 
saw the atrocities and barbarisms of his day and the glories of the future when new york was degraded enough to mob arthur tappan the noblest of her citizens when boston was sufficiently infamous to howl and hoot at harriet martineau the grandest englishwoman that ever touched our soil when the north was dominated by theology and trade by piety and piracy when we received our morals from merchants and made merchandise of our morals elijah wright held principle above profit and preserved his manhood at the peril of his life when the rich the cultured and the respectable when church members and ministers who had been called to preach the glad tidings and when statesmen like webster joined with bloodhounds and in the name of god hunted men and mothers this man rescued the fugitives and gave asylum to the oppressed during those infamous years years of cruelty and national degradation years of hypocrisy and greed and meanness beneath the reach of any english word elijah wright became acquainted with the orthodox church he found that a majority of christians were willing to enslave men and women for whom they said that christ had died that they would steal the babe of a christian mother although they believed that the mother would be their equal in heaven for ever he found that those who loved their enemies would enslave their friends that people who when smitten on one cheek turned the other were ready willing and anxious to mob and murder those who simply said the laborer is worthy of his hire in those days the church was in favor of slavery not only of the body but of the mind according to the creeds god himself was an infinite master and all his children serfs he ruled with whip and chain with pestilence and fire devils were his bloodhounds and hell his place of eternal torture elijah wright said to himself why should we take chains from bodies and enslave minds why fight to free the cage and leave the bird a prisoner he became an enemy of orthodox religion that is to say a friend of intellectual liberty he lived to see the destruction of legalized larceny to read the proclamation of emancipation to see a country without a slave a flag without a stain he lived long enough to reap the reward for having been an honest man long enough for his disgrace to become a crown of glory long enough to see his views adopted and his course applauded by the civilized world long enough for the hated word abolitionist to become a title of nobility a certificate of manhood courage and true patriotism only a few years ago the heretic was regarded as an enemy of the human race the man who denied the inspiration of the jewish scriptures was looked upon as a moral leper and the atheist as the worst of criminals even in that day elijah wright was grand enough to speak his honest thought to deny the inspiration of the bible brave enough to defy the god of the orthodox church the jehovah of the old testament the eternal jailer the everlasting inquisitor he contended that a good god would not have upheld slavery and polygamy that a loving father would not assist some of his children to enslave or exterminate their brethren that an infinite being would not be unjust irritable jealous revengeful ignorant and cruel and it was his great good fortune to live long enough to find the intellectual world on his side long enough to know that the greatest naturalists philosophers and scientists agreed with him long enough to see certain words change places so that heretic was honorable and orthodox and epithet to-day the heretic is known to be a man of principle and courage one blessed with enough mental independence to tell his thought to-day the thoroughly orthodox means the thoroughly stupid only a few years ago it was taken for granted that an unbeliever could not be a moral man 
that one who disputed the inspiration of the legends of judea could not be sympathetic and humane and could not really love his fellow-men had we no other evidence upon this subject the noble life of elijah wright would demonstrate the utter baselessness of these views his life was spent in doing good in attacking the hurtful in defending what he believed to be the truth generous beyond his means helping others to help themselves always hopeful busy just cheerful filled with the spirit of reform a model citizen always thinking of the public good devising ways and means to save something for posterity feeling that what he had held in trust loving nature familiar with the poetic side of things touched to enthusiasm by the beautiful thought the brave word and the generous deed friendly in manner candid and kind in speech modest but persistent enjoying leisure as only the industrious can loving and gentle in his family hospitable judging men and women regardless of wealth position or public clamor physically fearless intellectually honest thoroughly informed unselfish sincere and reliable as the attraction of gravitation such was elijah wright one of the staunchest soldiers that ever faced and braved for freedom's sake the wrath and scorn and lies of place and power a few days ago i met this genuine man his interest in all human things was just as deep and keen his hatred of oppression his love of freedom just as intense just as fervid as on the day i met him first true his body was old but his mind was young and his heart like a spring in the desert bubbled over as joyously as though it had the secret of eternal youth but it has ceased to beat and the mysterious veil that hangs where sight and blindness are the same the veil that revelation has not drawn aside that science cannot lift has fallen once again between the living and the dead and yet we hope and dream may be the longing for another life is but the prophecy forever warm from nature's lips that love disguised as death alone fulfils we cannot tell and yet perhaps this hope is but an antic following the fortunes of an uncrowned king beguiling grief with jest and satisfying loss with pictured gain we do not know but from the christian's cruel hell and from his heaven more heartless still the free and noble soul if forced to choose should loathing turn and cling with rapture to the thought of endless sleep but this we know good deeds are never childless a noble life is never lost a virtuous action does not die elijah wright scattered with generous hand the priceless seeds and we shall reap the golden grain his words and acts are ours and all he nobly did is living still farewell brave soul upon thy grave i lay this tribute of respect and love when last our hands were joined i said these parting words long life and i repeat them now end of section seven Section eight of Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. Section eight. A tribute to Mrs. Ida Whiting Knowles. New York, December sixteenth, eighteen eighty seven. My friends again we stand in the shadow of the great mystery a shadow as deep and dark as when the tears of the first mother fell upon the pallid face of her lifeless babe a mystery that has never yet been solved we have met in the presence of the sacred dead to speak a word of praise of hope of consolation another life of love is now a blessed memory a lingering strain of music the loving daughter the pure and consecrated wife the sincere friend who with tender faithfulness discharged the duties of a life has reached her journey's end a braver a more serene a more chivalric spirit clasping the love and by them clasped never passed from life to enrich the realm of death no field of war ever 
witnessed greater fortitude more perfect smiling courage than this poor weak and helpless woman displayed upon the bed of pain and death her life was gentle and her death sublime she loved the good and all the good loved her there is this consolation she can never suffer more never feel again the chill of death never part again from those she loves her heart can break no more she has shed her last tear and upon her stainless brow has been set the wondrous seal of everlasting peace when the angel of death the masked and voiceless enters the door of home there come with her all the daughters of compassion and of these love and hope remain for ever you are about to take this dear dust home to the home of her girlhood and to the place that was once my home you will lay her with neighbors whom i have loved and who are now at rest you will lay her where my father sleeps lay her i the earth and from her fair and unpolluted flesh may violets spring i never knew i never met a braver spirit than the one that once inhabited this silent form of dreamless clay end of section eight section nine of eulogies by colonel robert g ingersoll this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana eulogies by colonel robert g ingersoll section nine a tribute to rev henry ward beecher new york june twenty sixth eighteen eighty seven henry ward beecher was born in a puritan penitentiary of which his father was one of the wardens a prison with very narrow and closely grated windows under its walls were the rayless hopeless and measureless dungeons of the damned and on its roof fell the shadow of god's eternal frown in this prison the creed and catechism were primers for children and from the pure sense of duty their loving hearts were stained and scarred with the religion of john calvin in those days the home of an orthodox minister was an inquisition in which babes were tortured for the good of their souls children then as now rebelled against the infamous absurdities and cruelties of the creed no calvinist was ever able unless with blows to answer the questions of his child children were raised in what was called the nurture and admonition of the lord that is to say their wills were broken or subdued their natures were deformed and dwarfed their desires defeated or destroyed and their development arrested or perverted life was robbed of its spring its summer and its autumn children stepped from the cradle into the snow no laughter no sunshine no joyous free unburdened days god an infinite detective watched them from above and satan with malicious leer was waiting for their souls below between these monsters life was passed infinite consequences were predicated of the smallest action and a burden greater than a god could bear was placed upon the heart and brain of every child to think to ask questions to doubt to investigate were acts of rebellion to express pity for the lost writhing in the dungeons below was simply to give evidence that the enemy of souls had been at work within their hearts among all the religions of this world from the creed of cannibals who devoured flesh to that of calvinists who polluted souls there is none there has been none there will be none more utterly heartless and inhuman than was the orthodox congregationalism of new england in the year of grace eighteen thirteen it despised every natural joy hated pictures abhorred statues as lewd and lustful things execrated music regarded nature as fallen and corrupt man as totally depraved and woman as somewhat worse the theatre was a vestibule of perdition actors as servants of satan and shakespeare a trifling wretch whose words were seeds of death and yet the virtues found a welcome cordial and sincere 
duty was done as understood obligations were discharged truth was told self-denial was practised for the sake of others and many hearts were good and true in spite of book and creed in this atmosphere of theological miasma in this hideous dream of superstition in this penitentiary moral and austere this babe first saw the imprisoned gloom the natural desires ungratified the laughter suppressed the logic browbeaten by authority the humour frozen by fear of many generations were in this child a child destined to rend and wreck the prison's walls through the grated windows of his cell this child this boy this man caught glimpses of the outer world of fields and skies new thoughts were in his brain new hopes within his heart another heaven bent above his life there came a revelation of the beautiful and real theology grew mean and small nature wooed and won and saved this mighty soul her countless hands were sowing seeds within his tropic brain all sights and sounds all colors forms and fragments were stored within the treasury of his mind his thoughts were molded by the graceful curves of streams by winding paths of woods the charm of quiet country roads and lanes grown indistinct with weeds and grass by vines that cling and hide with leaf and flower the crumbling walls decay by cattle standing in the summer pools like statues of content there was within his words the subtle spirit of a season's change of everything that is of everything that lies between the slumbering seeds that half awakened by the april rain have dreams of heaven's blue and feel the amorous kisses of the sun and that strange tomb wherein the alchemist doth give to death's cold dust the throb and thrill of life again he saw with loving eyes the willows of the meadow streams grow red beneath the glance of spring the grass along the marsh's edge the stir of life beneath the withered leaves the moss below the drip of snow the flowers that give their blossom to the first south wind that woos the sad and timid violets that only bear the gaze of love from eyes half closed the ferns where fancy gives a thousand forms with but a single plan the green and sunny slopes enriched with daisies silver and the cowslips gold as in the leafless woods some tree aflame with life stands like a rapt poet in the heedless crowd so stood this man among his fellow-men all there is of leaf and bud of flower and fruit of painted insect life and all the winged and happy children of the air that summer holds beneath her dome of blue were known and loved by him he loved the yellow autumn fields the golden stacks the happy homes of men the orchards bending boughs the sumacs flags of flame the maples with transfigured leaves the tender yellow of the beech the wondrous harmonies of brown and gold the vines where hang the clustered spheres of wit and mirth he loved the winter days the whirl and drift of snow all forms of frost the rage and fury of the storm when in the forest desolate and stripped the brave old pine towers green and grand a prophecy of spring he heard the rhythmic sounds of nature's busy strife the hum of bees the song of birds the eagle's cry the murmur of the streams the sighs and lamentations of the winds and all the voices of the sea he loved the shores the vales the crags and cliffs the city's busy streets the introspective silent plain the solemn splendors of the night the silver sea of dawn and evening's clouds of molten gold the love of nature free this loving man one by one the fetters fell the gratings disappeared the sunshine smote the roof and on the floors of stone light streamed from open doors he realized the darkness and despair the cruelty and hate the starless blackness of the old malignant creed 
the flower of pity grew and blossomed in his heart the selfish consolation filled his eyes with tears he saw that what is called the christian hope is that among the countless billions wrecked and lost a meagre few perhaps may reach the eternal shore a hope that like the desert rain gives neither leaf nor bud a hope that gives no joy no peace to any great and loving soul it is the dust on which the serpent feeds that coils in heartless breasts day by day the wrath and vengeance faded from the sky the jewish god grew vague and dim the threads of torture and eternal pain grew vulgar and absurd and all the miracles seemed strangely out of place they clad the infinite in motley garb and gave to our old heads the cap and bell touched by the pathos of all human life knowing the shadows that fall on every heart the thorns in every path the sighs the sorrows and the tears that lie between a mother's arms and death's embrace this great and gifted man denounced denied and damned with all his heart the fanged and frightful dogma that souls were made to feed the eternal hunger ravenous as famine of a god's revenge take out this fearful fiendish heartless lie compared with which all other lies are true and the great arch of orthodox religion crumbling falls to the average man the christian hell and heaven are only words he has no scope of thought he lives but in a dim impoverished now to him the past is dead the future still unborn he occupies with downcast eyes that narrow line of barren shifting sand that lies between the flowing seas but genius knows all time for him the dead all live and breathe and act their countless parts again all human life is in his now and every moment feels the thrill of all to be no one can overestimate the good accomplished by this marvellous many-sided man he helped to slay the heart-devouring monster of the christian world he tried to civilize the church to humanize the creeds to soften pious breasts of stone to take the fear from mothers hearts the chains of creed from every brain to put the star of hope in every sky and over every grave attacked on every side maligned by those who preached the law of love he wavered not but fought whole-hearted to the end obstruction is but virtue's foil from thwarted light leaps colors flame the stream impeded has a song he passed from harsh and cruel creeds to that serene philosophy that has no place for pride or hate that threatens no revenge that looks on sin as stumblings of the blind and pities those who fall knowing that in the souls of all there is a sacred yearning for the light he ceased to think of man as something thrust upon the world an exile from some other sphere he felt at last that men are part of nature's self kindred of all life the gradual growth of countless years that all the sacred books were helps until outgrown and all religions rough and devious paths that man has worn with weary feet in sad and painful search for truth and peace to him these paths were wrong and yet all gave the promise of success he knew that all the streams no matter how they wander turn and curve amid the hills or rocks or linger in the lakes and pools must sometime reach the sea these views enlarged his soul and made him patient with the world and while the wintry snows of age were falling on his head spring with all her wealth of bloom was in his heart the memory of this ample man is now a part of nature's wealth he battled for the rights of men his heart was with the slave he stood against the selfish greed of millions banded to protect the pirate's trade his voice was for the right when freedom's friends were few he taught the church to think and doubt he did not fear to stand alone his brain took counsel of his heart to every foe he offered reconciliation's hand he loved this land of ours and added to its glory through the world 
he was the greatest orator that stood within the pulpit's narrow curve he loved the liberty of speech there was no trace of bigot in his blood he was a brave and generous man with reverent hands i place this tribute on his tomb end of section nine a tribute to henry ward beecher Section 10 of Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. Section 10. A Tribute to Roscoe Conkling. Footnote. It sometimes happens that a man who has risen to prominence among his fellows and his actions for good have won him fame, is made the recipient of a grand public ovation from the people among whom he dwells, and to whom his living presence is still an inspiration. It rarely comes to pass that when such a man has completed his career, and passed out of the world, his memory, and the mention of his name, still evoke response from the public mind and heart. There are few men, of whom it may be said, that memory of them inherited the love, the admiration the respect and the veneration of the public which their lives may have held roscoe conkling was one of these few and the throng of thousands that gathered last night to listen to the marvelously eloquent tribute paid to his character proved it eloquent as was that tribute a work of love from the greatest word painter of america's present generation a master of the harmony of language a close friend of the lamented statesman yet it was but such a eulogy as was just long before the hour set for the beginning of the memorial exercise a continuous stream of carriages and pedestrians poured toward the rink from all parts of the city and even the casual observer could soon realize that the capacity of the structure great as it is would not be great enough to accommodate half those who wished to attend at eight thirty o'clock the auditorium was packed from wall to wall and from the entrance doors to the footlights besides the stage was occupied by a large assemblage that overflowed into the wings even after every foot of space was occupied and the doors had to be closed the clamor of those who wanted to gain admission but could not still continued seats were reserved on the floor for senators and assemblymen the former met at the capitol and marched in a body to the rink on the stage were many state officials and other men of prominence and a number of ladies the only attempt at decoration was the draping of an american flag in front of the stage the desk of the distinguished orator was covered with an american flag and in front of it was a large crayon portrait of mr conkling the frame of which was draped at eight thirty lieutenant governor jones called the meeting to order announced that the meeting was a joint session of the state legislature held for the purpose of paying proper respect to the memory of the late roscoe conkling clerk john kenyon of the senate read the resolution of the senate under which the meeting was called and the concurrent resolution of the assembly governor jones then introduced colonel robert g ingersoll who delivered the eulogy the audience of three thousand or more people listened throughout in breathless silence except when enthusiastic approbation was manifested by bursts of applause at the conclusion of colonel ingersoll's address general husted arose and said mr chairman i move that the thanks of the legislature be tendered to the hon robert g ingersoll for the masterly oration to which we have listened and sir in making this motion i am confident that i express the unanimous sentiment of this body when i say that in purity of style in poetic expression in cogency of statement in brilliance of rhetoric it stands unrivalled among the eulogies of either ancient or modern days as effective as demosthenes as polished as cicero as ornate as burke as scholarly as gladstone the orator of the evening in surpassing others has eclipsed himself senator cogshall in seconding the motion said mr chairman no words that i can utter will add to the able and eloquent eulogy pronounced by mr ingersoll upon the life character and services of roscoe conkling it is indeed a worthy tribute by one of america's most gifted orators to one of the foremost men of his time on behalf of the senate and the assembly i second the motion of the gentleman from westchester lieutenant governor jones put the question which was carried with great enthusiasm 
Then the great assemblage dispersed. Albany Express, May 10, 1888. End of footnote. A tribute to Roscoe Conkling. Delivered before the New York State Legislature at Albany, New York, May 9, 1888. Roscoe Conkling. A great man. An orator, a statesman, a lawyer, a distinguished citizen of the Republic, in the zenith of his fame and power, has reached his journey's end, and we are met, here in the city of his birth, to pay our tribute to his worth and work. He earned and held a proud position in the public thought. He stood for independence, for courage, and above all for absolute integrity, and his name was known and honored by many millions of his fellow men. The literature of many lands is rich with the tributes that gratitude, admiration, and love have paid to the great and honored dead. These tributes disclose the character of nations, the ideals of the human race. In them we find the estimates of greatness, the deeds and lives that challenged praise and thrilled the hearts of men. In the presence of death, the good man judges as he would be judged. He knows that men are only fragments, that the greatest walk in shadow, and that the faults and failures mingle with the lives of all. In the grave should be buried the prejudices and passions born of conflict. Charity should hold the scales in which are weighed the deeds of men. Peculiarities, traits born of locality and surroundings, these are but the dust of the race. These are accidents, drapery, clothes, fashions, that have nothing to do with the man except to hide his character. They are the clouds that cling to mountains. Time gives us clearer vision. That which was merely local fades away. The words of envy are forgotten, and all there is of sterling worth remains. He who was called a partisan is a patriot. The revolutionist and the outlaw are the founders of nations, and he who is regarded as a scheming, selfish politician becomes a statesman, a philosopher, whose words and deeds shed light. Fortunate is that nation great enough to know the great. When a great man dies, one who has nobly fought the battle of a life, who has been faithful to every trust, and has uttered his highest, noblest thought, one who has stood proudly by the right in spite of jeer and taunt, neither stopped by foe nor swerved by friend, in honoring him, in speaking words of praise and love above his dust, we pay a tribute to ourselves. How poor this world would be without its graves, without the memories of its mighty dead. Only the voiceless speak forever. Intelligence, integrity, and courage are the great pillars that support the state. Above all, the citizens of a free nation should honor the brave and independent man, the man of stainless integrity, of will and intellectual force. Such men are the atlases on whose mighty shoulders rests the great fabric of the republic. Flatterers, cringers, crawlers, time-servers are the dangerous citizens of a democracy. They who gain applause and power by pandering to the mistakes, the prejudices, and the passions of the multitude, are the enemies of liberty. When the intelligent submit to the clamor of the many, anarchy begins and the republic reaches the edge of chaos. Mediocrity, touched with ambition, flatters the base and calumniates the great, while the true patriot, who will do neither, is often sacrificed. In a government of the people, a leader should be a teacher. He should carry the torch of truth. Most people are the slaves of habit, followers of custom, believers in the wisdom of the past. And were it not for brave and splendid souls, the dust of antique time would lie unswept, and mountainous error be too highly heaped for truth to overpeer. Custom is a prison, locked and barred by those who long ago were dust, the keys of which are in the keeping of the dead. Nothing is grander than when a strong, intrepid man breaks chains, levels walls, and breasts the many-headed mob like some great cliff that meets and mocks the innumerable billows of the sea. 
the politician hastens to agree with the majority insists that their prejudice is patriotism that their ignorance is wisdom not that he loves them but because he loves himself the statesman the real reformer points out the mistakes of the multitude attacks the prejudices of his countrymen laughs at their follies denounces their cruelties enlightens and enlarges their minds and educates the conscience not because he loves himself but because he loves and serves the right and wishes to make his country great and free with him defeat is but a spur to further effort he who refuses to stoop who cannot be bribed by the promise of success or the fear of failure who walks the highway of the right and in disaster stands erect is the only victor nothing is more despicable than to reach fame by crawling position by cringing when real history shall be written by the truthful and the wise these men these kneelers at the shrines of chance and fraud these brazen idols worshipped once as gods will be the very food of scorn while those who bore the burden of defeat who earned and kept their self-respect who would not bow to man or men for place or power will wear upon their brows the laurel mingled with the oak roscoe conkling was a man of superb courage he not only acted without fear but he had that fortitude of soul that bears the consequences of the course pursued without complaint he was charged with being proud the charge was true he was proud his knees were as inflexible as the unwedgeable and gnarled oak but he was not vain vanity rests on the opinion of others pride on our own the source of vanity is from without of pride from within vanity is a vein that turns a willow that bends with every breeze pride is the oak which defies the storm one is cloud the other rock one is weakness the other strength this imperious man entered public life in the dawn of the reformation at a time when the country needed men of pride of principle and courage the institution of slavery had poisoned all the springs of power before this crime ambition fell upon its knees politicians judges clergymen and merchant princes bowed low and humbly with their hats in their hands the real friend of man was denounced as the enemy of his country the real enemy of the human race was called a statesman and a patriot slavery was the bond in the pledge of peace of union and national greatness the temple of american liberty was finished the auction block was the cornerstone it is hard to conceive of the utter demoralization of the political blindness and immorality of the patriotic dishonesty of the cruelty and degradation of a people who supplemented the incomparable declaration of independence with the fugitive slave law think of the honored statesmen of that ignoble time who wallowed in this mire and who decorated with dripping filth received the plaudits of their fellow-men the noble the really patriotic were the victims of mobs and the shameless were clad in the robes of office but let us speak no word of blame let us feel that each one acted according to his light according to his darkness at last the conflict came the hosts of light and darkness prepared to meet upon the fields of war the question was presented shall the republic be slave or free the republican party had triumphed at the polls the greatest man in our history was president-elect the victors were appalled they shrank from the great responsibilities of success in the presence of rebellion they hesitated they offered to return the fruits of victory hoping to avert war they were willing that slavery should become immortal an amendment to the constitution was proposed to the effect that no subsequent amendment should ever be made that in any way should interfere with the right of man to steal his fellow men this the most marvelous proposition ever submitted to a congress of civilized men received in the house an overwhelming majority and the necessary two-thirds in the senate the republican party in the moment of his triumph 
deserted every principle for which it had so gallantly contended, and with the trembling hands of fear laid its convictions on the altar of compromise. The old guard, numbering but sixty-five in the house, stood as firm as the three hundred at Thermopylae. Thaddeus Stevens, as maliciously right as any other man was ever wrong, refused to kneel. Owen Lovejoy, remembering his brother's noble blood, refused to surrender, and on the edge of disunion, in the shadow of civil war, with the air filled with the sounds of dreadful preparation, while the Republican Party was retracting its steps, Roscoe Conklin voted no. This puts a wreath of glory on his tomb. From that vote to the last moment of his life, he was a champion of equal rights, staunch and stalwart. From that moment he stood in the front rank. He never wavered, and he never swerved. By his devotion to principle, his courage, the splendor of his diction, by his varied and profound knowledge, his conscientious devotion to the great cause, and by his intellectual scope and grasp, he won and held the admiration of his fellow men. Disasters in the field, reverses at the poles, did not and could not shake his courage or his faith. He knew the ghastly meaning of defeat. He knew that the great ship that slavery sought to strand and wreck was freighted with the world's sublimest hope. He battled for a nation's life, for the rights of slaves, the dignity of labor, and the liberty of all. He guarded with a father's care the rights of the hunted, the hated, and the despised. He attacked the savage statutes of the reconstructed states with a torrent of invective, scorn, and execration. He was not satisfied until the freedman was an American citizen, clothed with every civil right, until the Constitution was his shield, until the ballot was his sword. And long after we are dead, the colored man in this and other lands will speak his name in reverence and love. Others wavered, but he stood firm. Some were false, but he was proudly true, fearlessly faithful unto death. He gladly, proudly grasped the hands of colored men who stood with him as makers of our laws and treated them as equals and as friends. The cry of social equality, coined and uttered by the cruel and the base, was to him the expression of a great and splendid truth. He knew that no man can be the equal of the one he robs that the intelligent and unjust are not the superiors of the ignorant and the honest. And he also felt, and proudly felt, that if he were not too great to reach the hand of help and recognition to the slave, no other senator could rightfully refuse. We rise by raising others, and he who stoops above the fallen stands erect. Nothing can be grander than to sow the seeds of noble thoughts and virtuous deeds to liberate the bodies and the souls of men, to earn the grateful homage of a race, and then, in life's last shadowy hour, to know that the historian of liberty will be compelled to write your name. There are no words intense enough, with heart enough, to express my admiration for the great and gallant souls who have in every age and every land upheld the right, and who have lived and died for freedom's sake. In our lives have been the grandest years that man has lived, the time has measured by the flight of worlds. The history of that great party that let the oppressed go free, that lifted our nation from the depths of savagery to freedom's cloudless heights, and tore with holy hands from every law the words that sanctified the cruelty of man, is the most glorious in the annals of our race. Never before was there such a moral exaltation never a party with a purpose so pure and high. It was the embodied conscience of a nation, the enthusiasm of a people guided by wisdom, the impersonation of justice, and the sublime victory achieved, loaded even the conquered with all the rights that freedom can bestow. Roscoe Conklin was an absolutely honest man. Honesty is the oak around which all other virtues cling. Without that they fall, and groveling, 
die in weeds and dust. He believed that a nation should discharge its obligations. He knew that a promise could not be made often enough, or emphatic enough, to take the place of payment. He felt that the promise of the government was the promise of every citizen, that a national obligation was a personal debt, and that no possible combination of words and pictures could take the place of coin. He uttered the splendid truth that the higher obligations among men are not set down in writing, signed and sealed, but reside in honor. He knew that repudiation was the sacrifice of honor, the death of the national soul. He knew that without character, without integrity, there is no wealth, and that below poverty, below bankruptcy, is the rayless abyss of repudiation. He upheld the sacredness of contracts, a plighted national faith, and helped to save and keep the honor of his native land. This adds another laurel to his brow. He was the ideal representative, faithful and incorruptible. He believed that his constituents and his country were entitled to the fruit of his experience, to his best and highest thought. No man ever held the standard of responsibility higher than he. He voted according to his judgment, his conscience. He made no bargains. He neither bought nor sold. To correct evils, abolish abuses, and inaugurate reforms, he believed was not only the duty, but the privilege of a legislator. He neither sold nor mortgaged himself. He was in Congress during the years of vast expenditure, of war and waste, when the credit of the nation was loaned to individuals, when claims were thick as leaves in June, when the amendment of a statute, the change of a single word, meant millions, and when empires were given to corporations. He stood at the summit of his power, peer of the greatest, a leader tried and trusted. He had the tastes of a prince, the fortune of a peasant, and yet he never swerved. No corporation was great enough or rich enough to purchase him. His vote could not be bought for all the sun seas or the close earth wombs or the profound seas hide. His hand was never touched by any bribe, and on his soul there never was a sordid stain. Poverty was his priceless crown. Above his marvelous intellectual gifts, above all place he ever reached, above the ermine he refused, rises his integrity like some great mountain peak, and there it stands, firm as the earth beneath, pure as the stars above. He was a great lawyer. He understood the framework, the anatomy, the foundations of law, was familiar with the great streams and currents and tides of authority. He knew the history of legislation, the principles that have been settled upon the fields of war. He knew the maxims, those crystallizations of common sense, those hand grenades of argument. He was not a case lawyer, a decision index, or an echo. He was original, thoughtful, and profound. He had breadth and scope, resource, learning, logic, and, above all, a sense of justice. He was painstaking and conscientious, anxious to know the facts, preparing for every attack, ready for every defense. He rested only when the end was reached. During the contest, he neither sent nor received a flag of truce. He was true to his clients, making their case his. Feeling responsibility, he listened patiently to details, and to his industry there were only the limits of time and strength. He was a student of the Constitution. He knew the boundaries of state and federal jurisdiction, and no man was more familiar with those great decisions that are the peaks and promontories, the headlands and the beacons of the law. He was an orator, logical, earnest, intense, and picturesque. He laid the foundation with care, with accuracy and skill, and rose by cold gradation and well-balanced form from the cornerstone of the statement to the domed conclusion. He filled the stage. He satisfied the eye. The audience was his. He had that indefinable thing called presence. Tall, commanding, erect, ample in speech, graceful in compliment. 
titanic in denunciation rich in illustration prodigal of comparison in metaphor and his sentences measured and rhythmical fell like music on the enraptured throng he abhorred the pharisee and loathed all conscientious fraud he had a profound aversion for those who insist on putting base motives back of the good deeds of others he wore no mask he knew his friends his enemies knew him he had no patience with pretense with patriotic reasons for unmanly acts he did his work and bravely spoke his thought sensitive to the last degree he keenly felt the blows and stabs of the envious and obscure of the smallest of the weakest but the greatest could not drive him from conviction's field he would not stoop to ask or give an explanation he left his words and deeds to justify themselves he held in light esteem a friend who heard with half-believing ears the slander of a foe he walked a highway of his own and kept the company of his self-respect he would not turn aside to avoid a foe to greet or gain a friend in his nature there was no compromise to him there were but two paths the right and the wrong he was maligned misrepresented and misunderstood but he would not answer he knew that character speaks louder far than any words he was as silent then as he is now and his silence better than any form of speech refuted every charge he was an american proud of his country that was and ever will be proud of him he did not find perfection only in other lands he did not grow small and shrunken withered and apologetic in the presence of those upon whom greatness had been thrust by chance he could not be overawed by dukes or lords nor flattered into vertebrate less subservience by the patronizing smiles of kings in the midst of conventionalities he had the feeling of suffocation he believed in the royalty of man in the sovereignty of the citizen and in the matchless greatness of this republic he was of the classic mold a figure from the antique world he had the pose of the great statues the pride and bearing of the intellectual greek of the conquering roman and he stood in the wide free air as though within his veins there flowed the blood of a hundred kings and as he lived he died proudly he entered the darkness or the dawn that we call death unshrinkingly he passed beyond our horizon beyond the twilight's purple hills beyond the utmost reach of human harm or help to that vast realm of silence or of joy where the innumerable dwell and he has left with us his wealth of thought and deed the memory of a brave imperious honest man who bowed alone to death end of section ten a tribute to roscoe conkling section eleven of eulogies by colonel robert g ingersoll this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Three Dad. Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. Section 11. A Tribute to Richard H. Whiting. New York, May 24, 1888. My friends, the river of another life has reached the sea. Again, we are in the presence of that eternal peace that we call death. My life has been rich in friends but I have never had a better or truer one than he who lies in silence here. He was as steadfast, as faithful as the stars. Richard H. Whiting was an absolutely honest man. His word was gold. His promise was fulfillment. There never has been, never will be on this poor earth, anything nobler than an honest, loving soul. This man was as reliable as the attraction of gravitation, he knew no shadow of turning. He was as generous as autumn, as hospitable as summer, and as tender as a perfect day in June. He forgot only himself, and asked favors only for others. 
he begged for the opportunity to do good, to stand by a friend, to support a cause, to defend what he believed to be right. He was a lover of nature, of the woods, the fields, and flowers. He was a home builder. He believed in the family and the fireside, in the sacredness of the hearth. He was a believer in the religion of deed, and his creed was to do good. No man has ever slept in death who nearer lived his creed. I have known him for many years, and have yet to hear a word spoken of him except in praise. His life was full of honor, of kindness, and of helpful deeds. Besides all, his soul was free. He feared nothing except to do wrong. He was a believer in the gospel of help and hope. He knew how much better, how much more sacred, a kind act is than any theory the brain has wrought. The good are the noble. His life filled the lives of others with sunshine. He has left a legacy of glory to his children. They can truthfully say that within their veins is right royal blood, the blood of an honest, generous man, of a steadfast friend, of one who was true to the very gates of death. If there be another world, another life beyond the shore of this, if the great and good who died upon this orb are there, then the noblest and the best with eager hands have welcomed him, the equal in honor, in generosity of any one that ever passed beyond the veil. To me, this world is growing poor. New friends can never fill the places of the old. Farewell. If this is the end, then you have left us the sacred memory of a noble life. If this is not the end, there is no world in which you, my friend, will not be loved and welcomed. Farewell. End of section 11. A tribute to Richard H. Whiting. Section 12 of Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eulogies by Colonel Robert Ingersoll. Section 12. A Tribute to Cortland Palmer. Footnote. From the New York Times, July 24, 1888. Cortland Palmer, by profession a lawyer, a typical wealthy New Yorker with an inherited fortune and an abundance of leisure, is remembered chiefly as the founder of the 19th Century Club, a debating society devoted to the discussion of social, literary, artistic, theological, and scientific problems in the spirit of the broadest liberality which was held together for more than five years by the force of his energy and enthusiasm. Mr. Palmer has always been the president of this organization. Its first meeting was held at his residence in Gramercy Park in January 1883, and for some time afterward he offered to it the hospitality of his home. As membership increased and it became the fashion in polite society to attend the club meetings, the rooms of the American Art Association on Madison Square were secured, and a half-dozen meetings were held every winter. Finally, the club changed its meeting place to the handsome assembly rooms of the Metropolitan Opera House. At all the gatherings, the brilliantly lighted rooms were crowded with men and women in fashionable attire. On the platform, the discussions involved every presentable topic. Society was readjusted. Difficult theological problems were solved more or less to the satisfaction of the stray theologians present. The weightiest questions of modern science were heroically grappled with, the rules of art criticism were reformulated, and the needs of authors, and readers as well, were set forth with candor and fairness. Over all these debates, Mr. Palmer presided alertly and impartially, encouraging people to think for themselves. A number of learned and able men have taken part in the discussions, and they have spoken their views freely. Mr. Palmer's enthusiastic devotion 
to his society never relaxed to the day of his premature death he was as vigilant in securing speakers and selecting topics for them to speak upon as a theatrical impresario on the watch for new plays and new actors his own opinions on all subjects were extremely liberal palmer's death defied the stereotype that the deathbed of the unbeliever is an agonizing one it is noted his final words to family were i want you one and all to tell the whole world that you have seen a freethinker die without the last fear of what the hereafter may be End of footnote. and now here is colonel ingersoll's tribute new york july twenty sixth eighteen eighty eight my friends a thinker of pure thoughts a speaker of brave words a doer of generous deeds has reached the silent haven that all the dead have reached and where the voyage of every life must end and we his friends who even now are hastening after him are met to do the last kind acts that man may do for man to tell his virtues and to lay with tenderness and tears his ashes in the sacred place of rest and peace someone has said that in the open hands of death we find only what they gave away let us believe that pure thoughts brave words and generous deeds can never die let us believe that they bear fruit and add forever to the well-being of the human race let us believe that a noble self-defying life increases the moral wealth of man and gives assurance that the future will be grander than the past in the monotony of subservience in the multitude of blind followers nothing is more inspiring than a free and independent man one who gives and asks reasons one who demands freedom and gives what he demands one who refuses to be slave or master such a man was courtland palmer to whom we pay the tribute of respect and love he was an honest man he gave the rights that he claimed this was the foundation on which he built to think for himself to give his thought to others this was to him not only a privilege not only a right but a duty he believed in self-preservation in personal independence that is to say in manhood he preserved the realm of mind from the invasion of brute force and protected the children of the brain from the herod of authority he investigated for himself the questions and the problems and the mysteries of life majorities were nothing to him no error could be old enough popular plausible or profitable enough to bribe his judgment or to keep his conscience still he knew that next to finding truth the greatest joy is honest search he was a believer in intellectual hospitality in the fair exchange of thought in good mental manners in the amenities of the soul in the chivalry of discussion he insisted that those who speak should hear those who question should answer that each should strive not for a victory over others but for the discovery of truth and that truth when found should be welcomed by every human soul he knew that truth has no fear of investigation of being understood he knew that truth loves the day that its enemies are ignorance prejudice egotism bigotry hypocrisy fear and darkness and that intelligence candor honesty love and light are its eternal friends he believed in the mortality of the useful 
that the virtues are the friends of man, the seeds of joy. He knew that consequences determine the quality of actions, and that whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. In the positive philosophy of Auguste Comte, he found the framework of his creed. In the conclusions of that great, sublime, and tender soul, he found the rest, the serenity, and the certainty he sought. The clouds had fallen from his life. He saw that the old faiths were but phases in the growth of man, that out from the darkness, up from the depths, the human race through countless ages and in every land had struggled toward the ever-growing light. He felt that the living are indebted to the noble dead, and that each should pay his debt, that he should pay it by preserving to the extent of his power the good he has, by destroying the hurtful, by adding to the knowledge of the world, by giving better than he had received, and that each should be the bearer of a torch, a giver of light for all that is, for all to be. This was the religion of duty perceived, of duty within the reach of man, within the circumference of the known, a religion without mystery, with experience for the foundation of belief, a religion understood by the head and approved by the heart, a religion that appealed to reason with a definite end in view, the civilization and development of the human race by legitimate, adequate, and natural means. That is to say, by ascertaining the conditions of progress and by teaching each to be noble enough to live for all. This is the gospel of man. This is the gospel of the world. This is the religion of humanity. This is a philosophy that contemplates not with scorn, but with pity, with admiration, and with love, all that man has done, regarding, as it does, the past with all its faults and virtues, its sufferings, its cruelties and crimes, as the only road by which the perfect could be reached. He denied the supernatural the phantoms and the ghosts that fill the twilight land of fear. To him and for him there was but one religion, the religion of pure thoughts, of noble words, of self-denying deeds, of honest work for all the world, the religion of help and hope. Facts were the foundation of his faith. History was his prophet, Reason was his guide, duty his deity, happiness the end, and intelligence the means. He knew that man must be the providence of man. He did not believe in religion and science, but in the religion of science. That is to say, wisdom glorified by love, the savior of our race the religion that conquers prejudice and hatred, that drives all superstition from the mind, that ennobles, lengthens, and enriches life, that drives from every home the wolves of want, from every heart the fiends of selfishness and fear, and from every brain the monsters of the night. He lived and labored for his fellow men. He sided with the weak and poor, against the strong and rich. He welcomed light. His face was ever toward the east. According to this light he lived. The world was his country. To do good his religion. There is no language to express a nobler creed than this. Nothing can be grander, more comprehensive, nearer perfect. This was the creed that glorified his life and made his death sublime. He was afraid to do wrong, and for that reason was not afraid to die. He knew that the end was near. He knew that his work was done. He stood within the twilight, within the deepening gloom, 
knowing that for the last time the gold was fading from the west, and that there could not fall again within his eyes the trembling luster of another dawn. He knew that night had come, and yet his soul was filled with light, for in that night the memory of his generous deeds shone out like stars. What can we say? What words can solve the mystery of life, the mystery of death? What words can justly pay a tribute to the man who lived to his ideal, who spoke his honest thought, and who was turned aside neither by envy, nor hatred, nor contumely, nor slander, nor scorn, nor fear? What words will do that life the justice which we know and feel? A heart breaks, a man dies, a leaf falls in the far forest. A babe is born, and the great world sweeps on. By the grave of man stands the angel of silence. No one can tell which is better. Life, with its gleams and shadows, its thrills and pain, its ecstasy and tears, its wreaths and thorns, its crowns, its glories, and Golgothas or death, with its peace, its rest, its cool and placid brow that hath within no memory or fear of grief or pain. Farewell, dear friend. The world is better for your life. The world is braver for your death. Farewell. We loved you living, and we love you now. End of section 12, a tribute to Cortland Palmer. Section 13 of Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Edward Kirkby, Warwick, England. Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. Section 13, A Tribute to Mrs. Mary H. Fisk, at Scottish Rite Hall, New York, February 6th, 1889. My friends, in the presence of the two great mysteries, life and death, we are met to say above this still, unconscious house of clay, a few words of kindness, of regret, of love and hope. In this presence, let us speak of the goodness, the charity, the generosity, and the genius of the dead. Only flowers should be laid upon the tomb. In life's last pillow there should be no thorns. Mary Fisk was like herself. She patterned after none. She was a genius, and put her soul in all she did and wrote. She cared nothing for roads, nothing for beaten paths, nothing for the footsteps of others. She went across the fields and through the woods and by the winding streams and down the vales or over crags wherever fancy led. She wrote lines that leaped with laughter and words that were wet with tears. She gave us quaint thoughts and sayings filled with the pert and nimble spirit of mirth. Her pages were flecked with sunshine and shadow, and in every word were the pulse and breath of life. Her heart went out to all the wretched in this weary world, and yet she seemed as joyous as though grief and death were naught but words. She wept where others wept, but in her own misfortunes found the food of hope. She cared for the tomorrow of others, but not for her own. She lived for today. Some hearts are like a waveless pool, satisfied to hold the image of a wondrous star, but hers was full of motion, life and light and storm. She longed for freedom, 
every limitation was a prison's wall rules were shackles and forms were made for serfs and slaves she gave her utmost thought she praised all generous deeds applauded the struggling and even those who failed she pitied the poor the forsaken the friendless no one could fall below her pity no one could wander beyond the circumference of her sympathy to her there were no outcasts there were victims she knew that the inhabitants of palaces and penitentiaries might change places without adding to the injustice of the world she knew that circumstances and conditions determined character that the lowest and the worst of our race were children once as pure as light whose cheeks dimpled with smiles beneath the heaven of a mother's eyes she thought of the road they had travelled of the thorns that had pierced their feet of the deserts they had crossed and so instead of words of scorn she gave the eager hand of help no one appealed to her in vain she listened to the story of the poor and all she had she gave a god could do no more the destitute and suffering turned naturally to her the maimed and hurt sought for her open door and the helpless put their hands in hers she shielded the weak she attacked the strong her heart was open as the gates of day she shed kindness as the sun sheds light if all her deeds were flowers the air would be faint with perfume if all her charities could change to melodies a symphony would fill the sky mary fisk had within her brain the divine fire called genius and in her heart the touch of nature that makes the whole world kin she wrote as a stream runs that winds and babbles through the shadowy fields that falls in foam of flight and haste and laughing joins the sea a little while ago a babe was found one that had been abandoned by its mother left as a legacy to chance or fate the warm heart of mary fisk now cold in death was touched she took the waif and held it lovingly to her breast and made the child her own we pray thee mother nature that thou wilt take this woman and hold her as tenderly in thy arms as she held and pressed against her generous throbbing heart the abandoned babe we ask no more in this presence let us remember our faults our frailties and the generous helpful self-denying loving deeds of mary fisk end of section thirteen a tribute to mrs mary h fisk recording by edward kirkby warwick england section fourteen of eulogies by colonel robert g ingersoll this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. Section 14. A Tribute to Horace Seaver. At Payne Hall, Boston, August 25, 1889. Footnote. The eulogy pronounced at the funeral of Horace Seaver in Payne Hall last Sunday was the tribute of one great man to another. To have Robert G. Ingersoll speak words of praise above the silent form is fame. To deserve these words is immortality. The Boston Investigator, August 28, 1889. Horace Seaver was a pioneer, a torch-bearer, a toiler in that great field we call the world, a worker for his fellow men. At the end of his task he has fallen asleep, and we are met to tell the story of his long and useful life, to pay our tribute to his work and worth. He was one who saw the dawn while others lived in night. He kept his face toward the purpling east and watched the coming of the blessed day. 
he always sought for light. His object was to know, to find a reason for his faith, a fact on which to build. In superstition's sands he sought the gems of truth. In superstition's night he looked for stars. Born in New England, reared amidst the cruel superstitions of his age and time, he had the manhood and the courage to investigate, and he had the goodness and the courage to tell his honest thoughts. He was always kind, and sought to win the confidence of men by sympathy and love. There was no taint or touch of malice in his blood. To him his fellows did not seem depraved. They were not wholly bad. There was within the heart of each the seeds of good. He knew that back of every thought and act were forces uncontrolled. He wisely said, Circumstances furnish the seeds of good and evil, and man is but the soil in which they grow. Horace Seaver was crowned with the wreath of his own deeds, woven by the generous hand of a noble friend. He fought the creed and loved the man. He pitied those who feared and shuddered at the thought of death, who dwelt in darkness and in dread. The religion of his day filled his heart with horror. He was kind, compassionate, and tender. He could not fall upon his knees before a cruel and revengeful God. He could not bow to one who slew with famine, sword and fire, to one pitiless as pestilence, relentless as the lightning stroke. Jehovah had no attribute that he could love. He attacked the creed of New England, a creed that had within it the ferocity of Knox, the malice of Calvin, the cruelty of Jonathan Edwards, a religion that had a monster for a god, a religion whose dogmas would have shocked cannibals feasting on babies. Horace Seaver followed the light of his brain, the impulse of his heart. He was attacked, but he answered the insulter with a smile. And even he who coined malignant lies was treated as a friend misled. He did not ask God to forgive his enemies, he forgave them himself. He was sincere. Sincerity is the true and perfect mirror of the mind. It reflects the honest thought. It is the foundation of character, and without it there is no moral grandeur. Sacred are the lips from which has issued only truth. Over all wealth, above all station, above the noble, the robed and crowned, rises the sincere man. Happy is the man who neither paints nor patches, veils nor veneers. Blessed is he who wears no mask. The man who lies before us, wrapped in perfect peace, practiced no art to hide or half conceal his thought. He did not write or speak the double words that might be useful in retreat. He gave a truthful transcript of his mind and sought to make his meaning clear as light. To use his own words, he had the courage which impels a man to do his duty, to hold fast his integrity, to maintain a conscience void of offense, at every hazard and at every sacrifice in defiance of the world. He lived to his ideal. He sought the approbation of himself. He did not build his character upon the opinions of others, and it was out of the very depths of his nature that he had asked this profound question. What is there in other men that makes us desire their approbation and fear their censure more than our own? Horace Seaver was a good and loyal citizen of the mental republic, a believer in intellectual hospitality, one who knew that bigotry is born of ignorance and fear, the provincialisms of the brain. He did not belong to the tribe or to the nation, but to the human race. His sympathy was wide as want and, like the sky, bent above the suffering world. This man had that superb thing called moral courage, courage in its highest form. He knew that his thoughts were not the thoughts of others, that he was with the few, and that where one would take his side, thousands would be his eager foes. He knew that wealth would scorn and cultured ignorance deride, and that believers in the creeds, buttressed by law and custom, would hurl the missiles of revenge and hate. 
he knew that lies like snakes would fill the pathway of his life and yet he told his honest thought told it without hatred and without contempt told it as it really was and so through all his days his heart was sound and stainless to the core when he enlisted in the army whose banner is light the honest investigator was looked upon as lost and cursed and even christian criminals held him in contempt the believing embezzler the orthodox wife-beater even the murderer lifted his bloody hands and thanked god that on his soul there was no stain of unbelief in nearly every state of our republic the man who denied the absurdities and impossibilities lying at the foundation of what is called orthodox religion was denied his civil rights he was not canopied by the aegis of the law he stood beyond the reach of sympathy he was not allowed to testify against the invader of his home the seeker for his life his lips were closed he was declared dishonorable because he was honest his unbelief made him a social leper a pariah an outcast he was the victim of religious hate and scorn arrayed against him were all the prejudices and all the forces of hypocrisies of society all mistakes and lies were his enemies even the theist was denounced as a disturber of the peace although he told his thoughts in kind and candid words he was called a blasphemer because he sought to rescue the reputation of his god from the slanders of orthodox priests such was the bigotry of the time that natural love was lost the unbelieving son was hated by his pious sire and even the mother's heart was by her creed turned into stone horace seaver pursued his way he worked and wrought as best he could in solitude and want he knew the day would come he lived to be rewarded for his toil to see most of the laws repealed that had made outcasts of the noblest the wisest and the best he lived to see the foremost preachers of the world attack the sacred creeds he lived to see the sciences released from the superstition's clutch he lived to see the orthodox theologian take his place with the professor of the black art the fortune teller and the astrologer he lived to see the greatest of the world accept his thought to see the theologian displaced by the true priests of nature by humboldt and darwin by huxley and Haeckel. within the narrow compass of his life the world was changed the railway the steamship and the telegraph made all nations neighbors countless inventions have made the luxuries of the past the necessities of today life has been enriched and man ennobled the geologist had read the records of frost and flame of wind and wave the astronomer has told the story of the stars the biologist has sought the germ of life and in every department of knowledge the torch of science sheds its sacred light the ancient creeds have grown absurd the miracles are small and mean the inspired book is filled with fables told to please a childish world and the dogma of eternal pain now shocks the heart and brain he lived to see a monument unveiled to bruno in the city of rome to giordano bruno that great man who two hundred and eighty-nine years ago suffered death for having proclaimed the truths that since have filled the world with joy he lived to see the victim of the church a victor lived to see his memory honored by a nation freed from papal chains he worked knowing what the end must be expecting little while he lived but knowing that every fact in the wide universe was on his side he knew that truth can wait and so he worked patient as eternity he had the brain of a philosopher and the heart of a child horace seaver was a man of common sense by that i mean one who knows the law of average he denied the bible not on account of what has been discovered in astronomy or the length of time it took to form the delta of the nile but he compared the things he found with what he knew he knew that antiquity added nothing to probability that lapse of time can never take the place of cause and that the dust can never gather thick enough upon mistakes to make them equal with the truth 
he knew that the old by no possibility could have been more wonderful than the new and that the present is a perpetual torch by which we know the past to him all miracles were mistakes whose parents were cunning and credulity he knew that miracles were not because they are not he believed in the sublime unbroken and eternal march of causes and effects denying the chaos of chance and the caprice of power he tested the past by the now and judged all of the men and races of the world by those he knew he believed in the religion of free thought and good deed of character of sincerity of honest endeavor of cheerful help and above all in the religion of love and liberty in a religion for every day for the world in which we live for the present the religion of roof and raiment of food of intelligence of intellectual hospitality the religion that gives health and happiness freedom and content in the religion of work and in the ceremonies of honest labor he lived for this world if there be another he will live for that he did what he could for the destruction of fear the destruction of the imaginary monster who rewards the few in heaven the monster who tortures the many in perdition he was a friend of all the world and sought to civilize the human race for more than fifty years he labored to free the bodies and the souls of men and many thousands have read his words with joy he sought the suffering and oppressed he sat by those in pain, and his helping hand was laid in pity on the brow of death. He asked only to be treated as he treated others. He asked for only what he earned, and had the manhood cheerfully to accept the consequences of his actions. He expected no reward for the goodness of another. But he has lived his life. We should shed no tears except the tears of gratitude. We should rejoice that he lived so long in nature's course his time had come the four seasons were complete in him the spring could never come again the measure of his years was full when the day is done when the work of a life is finished when the gold of evening meets the dusk of night beneath the silent stars the tired laborer should fall asleep to outlive usefulness is a double death let me not live after my flame lacks oil to be the snuff of younger spirits. When the old oak is visited in vain by spring, when the light and rain no longer thrill, it is not well to stand leafless, desolate, and alone. It is better far to fall where nature softly covers all with woven moss and creeping vine. How little, after all, we know of what is ill or well, how little of this wondrous stream of cataracts and pools this stream of life that rises in a world unknown and flows to that mysterious sea whose shore the foot of one who comes has never pressed how little of this life we know this struggling ray of light twixt gloom and gloom this strip of land by verdure clad between the unknown wastes this throbbing moment filled with love and pain this dream that lies between the shadowy shores of sleep and death. We stand upon this verge of crumbling time. We love, we hope, we disappear. Again we mingle with the dust, and the not intrinsic forever falls apart. But this we know, a noble life enriches all the world. Horace Seaver lived for others. He accepted toil and hope deferred, Poverty was his portion. Like Socrates, he did not seek to adorn his body, but rather his soul, with the jewels of charity, modesty, courage, and above all, with a love of liberty. Farewell, O brave and modest man. Your lips, between which truths burst into blossoms, are forever closed. Your loving heart has ceased to beat, your busy brain is still and from your hand has dropped the sacred torch. Your noble, self-denying life has honored us, and we will honor you. You were my friend, and I was yours. Above your silent clay, I pay this tribute to your worth. Farewell. 
End of section 14. A tribute to Horace Seaver. Section 15 of Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eulogies by Colonel Robert Green Ingersoll. Section 15 a tribute to lawrence barrett at the broadway theatre new york march twenty second eighteen ninety one footnote to colonel ingersoll's tribute to lawrence barrett from the world colonel robert g ingersoll's lecture on shakespeare at the broadway theatre last night in aid of the building fund of the press club was a success from every point of view the house was crowded and over two hundred people occupied seats on the stage hundreds were turned away from the box office before the lecture began the immense audience present listened to an orator who was thoroughly wrapped up in his subject colonel ingersoll is a shakespearean enthusiast and his treatment of the immortal dramatist was masterly throughout and exquisite in its finer passages he held the vast throng spellbound and at the close of his preoration his delighted hearers cheered again and again until he was compelled to acknowledge the tribute to his eloquence by reappearing on the stage after the applause subsided when colonel ingersoll first made his appearance he prefaced his lecture by offering his tribute to the memory of lawrence barrett the world new york march twenty third eighteen ninety one a tribute to lawrence barrett my heart tells me that on the threshold of my address it will be appropriate for me to say a few words about the great actor who has just fallen into that sleep we call death. Lawrence Barrett was my friend, and I was his. He was an interpreter of Shakespeare, to whose creations he gave flesh and blood. He began at the foundation of his profession, and rose until he stood next to his friend, next to the one who was regarded as the greatest tragedian of our time, next to Edwin Booth. The life of Lawrence Barrett was a success, because he honored himself and added glory to the stage. He did not seek for gain by pandering to the thoughtless, ignorant, or base. He gave the drama in its highest and most serious form. He shunned the questionable, the vulgar and impure, and gave the intellectual, the pathetic, the manly and the tragic. He did not stoop to conquer. He soared. He was fitted for the stage. He had a thoughtful face, a vibrant voice, and the pose of chivalry. And besides, he had patience, industry, courage, and the genius of success. He was a graceful and striking Bassanio, a thoughtful Hamlet, an intense Othello, a marvelous Harebell, and the best Cassius of his century. In the drama of human life, all are actors and no one knows his part in this great play the scenes are shifted by unknown forces and the commencement plot and end are still unknown are still unguessed one by one the players leave the stage and others take their places there is no pause 
the play goes on no prompter's voice is heard and no one has the slightest clue to what the next scene is to be will this great drama have an end will the curtain fall at last will it rise again upon some other stage reason says perhaps and hope still whispers yes sadly i bid my friend farewell i admired the actor and i loved the man End of section 15. A tribute to Lawrence Barrett. Recording by Scott Daniker, Elizabeth City, North Carolina. www.zeppelfart.com Section 16 of Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. A tribute to Walt Whitman, Camden, New Jersey, March 30th, 1892. Footnote. New York Herald, March 31st, 1892. For a few brief hours yesterday, the dust of Walt Whitman dwelt again among the people whom he loved, and then was borne away and lowered into his tomb in Harley Cemetery. They came by hundreds and thousands, the common folk whom he loved. They gathered about his tiny, shabby little cottage in Mickle Street in Camden, until the street was blocked and the policemen began to look anxious. They had been bidden to come at eleven. At ten there was a throng, and it was deemed wise to open the door and let the people in. From that time until after one the line was never broken, and though it was hurried along as fast as possible, still the waiting throng grew larger. If it had been some great general instead of a simple singer, one might have understood the rush. But it was plain to see that more came as friends than as curiosity-seekers. The body lay in its plain oak casket in the bare back parlor, while the people filed softly past. "'How beautiful! How beautiful a face! Oh, if it could be painted as it is!' cried the veteran Moncure D. Conway, as he bent above the white and clean-cut features framed in snow. Mr. Conway was not the only writer of Mark who had come a long distance to the funeral. Quaint old John Burroughs was there. E. C. Stedman, J. H. Stoddard, Mr. Julian Hawthorne, and many others. Some who could not come in person sent flowers or wreaths of green. When the doors shut and the crowd had departed, it was found that many had dropped small sprigs of violets and other blossoms on the casket. Just at this moment Colonel R. G. Ingersoll came hurrying in night and day he had been speeding across the country from canada in order to be present and speak the promised word above the friend with whom he had disagreed religiously and otherwise in such friendly fashion his rotund face looked more sad than i ever saw it look before death touched him very close when it touched whitman when the funeral cortege reached the cemetery close on three o'clock it found the little dell where the tomb is set packed with people there were at least three thousand there a small tent had been set up on a level spot and here they clustered round close packed to listen to the tributes of the chosen speakers there was intense silence when colonel ingersoll arose and in those glowing periods for which he is world famous scattered flowers of speech over the ashes of his friend when the great orator had spoken and his words dwelt on the ear like rich music there was nothing left to do but consign walt whitman to his tomb and this was done without parade or ceremony End of footnote. ingersoll's tribute my friends again we in the mystery of life are brought face to face with the mystery of death a great man a great american 
the most eminent citizen of this republic lies dead before us and we have met to pay a tribute to his greatness and his worth i know he needs no words of mine his fame is secure he laid the foundations of it deep in the human heart and brain he was above all i have known the poet of humanity of sympathy he was so great that he rose above the greatest that he met without arrogance and so great that he stooped to the lowest without conscious condescension he never claimed to be lower or greater than any of the sons of men he came into our generation a free untrammelled spirit with sympathy for all his arm was beneath the form of the sick he sympathized with the imprisoned and despised and even on the brow of crime he was great enough to place the kiss of human sympathy one of the greatest lines in our literature is his and the line is great enough to do honor to the greatest genius that has ever lived he said speaking of an outcast not till the sun excludes you do i exclude you his charity was as wide as the sky and wherever there was human suffering human misfortune the sympathy of whitman bent above it as the firmament bends above the earth he was built on a broad and splendid plan ample without appearing to have limitations passing easily for a brother of mountains and seas and constellations caring nothing for the little maps and charts with which timid pilots hug the shore but giving himself freely with recklessness of genius to winds and waves and tides caring for nothing as long as the stars were above him he walked among men among writers among verbal varnishers and veneerers among literary milliners and tailors with the unconscious majesty of an antique god he was the poet of that divine democracy which gives equal rights to all the sons and daughters of men he uttered the great american voice uttered a song worthy of the great republic no man ever said more for the rights of humanity more in favor of real democracy of real justice he neither scorned nor cringed was neither tyrant nor a slave he asked only to stand the equal of his fellows beneath the great flag of nature the blue and stars he was the poet of life it was a joy simply to breathe he loved the clouds he enjoyed the breath of morning the twilight the wind the winding streams he loved to look at the sea when the waves burst into the white caps of joy he loved the fields the hills he was acquainted with the trees with birds with all the beautiful objects of the earth he not only saw these objects but understood their meaning and he used them that he might exhibit his heart to his fellow men he was the poet of love he was not ashamed of that divine passion that has built every home in the world that divine passion that has painted every picture and given us every real work of art that divine passion that has made the world worth living in and has given some value to human life he was the poet of the natural and taught men not to be ashamed of that which is natural he was not only the poet of democracy not only the poet of the great republic but he was the poet of the human race he was not confined to the limits of this country but his sympathy went out over the seas to all the nations of the earth he stretched out his hand and felt himself the equal of all kings and of all princes and brother of all men no matter how high no matter how low he has uttered more supreme words than any writer of our century possibly of almost any other he was above all things a man and above genius above all the snow-capped peaks of intelligence above all art rises the true man greater than all is the true man and he walked among his fellow men as such he was the poet of death he accepted all life and all death and he justified all he had the courage to meet all 
and is great enough and splendid enough to harmonize all and to accept all there is of life as a divine melody you know better than i what his life has been but let me say one thing knowing as he did what others can know and what they cannot he accepted and absorbed all theories all creeds all religions and believed in none his philosophy was a sky that embraced all clouds and accounted for all clouds he had a philosophy and a religion of his own broader as he believed and as i believe than others he accepted all he understood all and he was above all he was absolutely true to himself he had frankness and courage and he was as candid as light he was willing that all the sons of men should be absolutely acquainted with his heart and brain he had nothing to conceal frank candid pure serene noble and yet for years he was maligned and slandered simply because he had the candor of nature he will be understood yet and that for which he was condemned his frankness his candor will add to the glory and greatness of his fame he wrote a liturgy for mankind he wrote a great and splendid psalm of life and he gave to us the gospel of humanity the greatest gospel that can be preached he was not afraid to live not afraid to die for many years he and death were near neighbors he was always willing and ready to meet and greet this king called death and for many months he sat in the deepening twilight waiting for the night waiting for the light he never lost his hope when the mists filled the valleys he looked upon the mountain tops and when the mountains in darkness disappeared he fixed his gaze upon the stars in his brain were the blessed memories of the day and in his heart were mingled the dawn and dusk of life he was not afraid he was cheerful every moment the laughing nymphs of day did not desert him they remained that they might clasp the hands and greet with smiles the veiled and silent sisters of the night and when they did come walt whitman stretched his hand to them on one side were the nymphs of the day on the other the silent sisters of the night and so hand in hand between smiles and tears he reached his journey's end from the frontier of life from the western wave-kissed shore he sent us messages of content and hope and these messages seem now like strains of music blown by the mystic trumpeter from death's pale realm Today we give back to mother nature to her clasp and kiss one of the bravest sweetest souls that ever lived in human clay charitable as the air and generous as nature he was negligent of all except to do and say what he believed he should do and should say and i today thank him not only for you but for myself for all the brave words he has uttered I thank him for all the great and splendid words he has said in favor of liberty, in favor of man and woman, in favor of motherhood, in favor of fathers, in favor of children, and I thank him for the brave words that he has said of death. He has lived, he has died, and death is less terrible than it was before thousands and millions will walk down into the dark valley of the shadow holding walt whitman by the hand long after we are dead the brave words he has spoken will sound like trumpets to the dying and so i lay this little wreath upon this great man's tomb i loved him living and i love him still end of section sixteen a tribute to walt whitman Section 17 of Eulogies by Colonel Robert Green Ingersoll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Eulogies by Colonel Robert Green Ingersoll. Section 17. A Tribute to Philo D. Beckwith. Delwajack, Michigan, January 25th, 1893. Footnote to Colonel Ingersoll's Tribute to Philo D. Beckwith from the New York Dramatic Mirror. Some time ago in Dowajack, Michigan, died Philo D. Beckwith, a man of broad views and great business capacity. This little but bustling village will become artistically famous through P.D. Beckwith, who practically originated it. He made a great fortune here, but he lost no kindness of heart with the acquisition of money. During the latter part of his life, he expressed a desire to erect in this town a theater that would ensure to his fellow townsmen the very best of attractions, irrespective of the very small offerings that the place would naturally make to the greater stars and companies. Money-making did not enter into Mr. Beckwith's plan. He was willing to pay the deficit that it involved. He died before he could put his purpose into execution, but his heirs have carried out his wishes to the letter, and Dowajack now boasts of the handsomest theatre of its size in the world, while the endowment for its support will ensure its use as its noble projector planned. The building is a plain structure, exteriorly, of red-pressed brick and brownstone trimmings. A noble exterior feature, however, is a frieze of portraits in terracotta base reliefs of eminent writers, philosophers, artists, and actors. The collection favors those of broad religious views. Mr. Beckwith was a great admirer of Thomas Paine, Voltaire, and Robert G. Ingersoll, who recently delivered an address upon Shakespeare at the formal dedication of this theater. And in this frieze are Shakespeare, Ingersoll, Voltaire, Thomas Paine, Rachel, and others. New York Dramatic Mirror, February 1893 A Tribute to Philo D. Beckwith Ladies and Gentlemen, Nothing is nobler than to plant the flower of gratitude on the grave of a generous man, of one who labored for the good of all, whose hands were open and whose heart was full. Praise for the noble dead is an inspiration for the noble living. Loving words sow seeds of love in every gentle heart. Appreciation is the soil and climate of good and generous deeds. We are met tonight not to pay, but to acknowledge a debt of gratitude to one who lived and labored here, who was the friend of all, and who for many years was the providence of the poor to one who left to those who knew him best the memory of countless loving deeds, the richest legacy that man can leave to man. We are here to dedicate this monument to the stainless memory of Philo D. Beckwith, one of the kings of men. This monument, this perfect theater, this beautiful house of cheerfulness and joy, this home and child of all the arts, this temple where the architect, the sculptor, and painter united to build and decorate a stage where on the drama with a thousand tongues will tell the frailties and virtues of the human race. And music with her thrilling voice will touch the source of happy tears. This is a fitting monument to the man whose memory we honor, to one who, 
broadening with the years, outgrew the cruel creeds, the heartless dogmas of his time, to one who passed from superstition to science, from religion to reason, from theology to humanity, from slavery to freedom, from the shadow of fear to the blessed light of love and courage, to one who believed in intellectual hospitality, in the perfect freedom of the soul, and hated tyranny in every form, with all his heart, to one whose head and hands were in partnership, constituting the firm of intelligence and industry, and whose heart divided the profits with his fellow men, to one who fought the battle of life alone, without the aid of place or wealth, and yet grew nobler and gentler with success, to one who tried to make a heaven here, and who believed in the blessed gospel of cheerfulness and love, of happiness and hope. And it is fitting, too, that this monument should be adorned with the sublime faces wrought in stone of the immortal dead, of those who battled for the rights of man, who broke the fetters of the slave, of those who filled the minds of men with poetry, art, and light, of Voltaire, who abolished torture in France, and who did more for liberty than any other of the sons of men, of Thomas Paine, whose pen did as much as any sword to make the new world free, of Victor Hugo, who wept for those who weep, of Emerson, worshipper of the ideal, who filled the mind with suggestions of the perfect, of Goethe, the poet-philosopher, of Whitman, the ample, wide as the sky, author of the tenderest, the most pathetic, the sublimest poem that this continent has produced, of Shakespeare, the king of all, of Beethoven, the divine, of Chopin, and Verdi, and of Wagner, grandest of them all, whose music satisfies the heart and brain and fills imagination's sky, of George Eliot, who wove within her brain the purple robe her genius wears, of George Sand, subtle and sincere, passionate and free, and with these, faces of those who, on the stage, have made the mimic world as real as life and death. Beneath the loftiest monuments may be found ambition's worthless dust, while those who lived the loftiest lives are sleeping now in unknown graves. It may be that the bravest of the brave who ever fell upon the field of ruthless war was left without a grave to mingle slowly with the land he saved. But here and now the man and monument agree and blend like sounds that meet and melt in melody. A monument for the dead, a blessing for the living, a memory of tears, a prophecy of joy. Fortunate the people were this good man lived, for they are all his heirs, and fortunate for me that I have had the privilege of laying this little laurel wreath upon his unstained brow. And now, speaking for those he loved, for those who represent the honored dead, I dedicate this home of mirth and song, of poetry and art, 
to the memory of philo d beckwith a true philosopher a real philanthropist end of section seventeen a tribute to philo d beckwith Section number 18 of Eulogies by Colonel Robert Green Ingersoll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. Section 18. A TRIBUTE TO ANTON SEIDEL In the noon and zenith of his career, in the flush of glory and success, Anton Seidel, the greatest orchestral leader of all time, the perfect interpreter of Wagner, of all his subtlety and sympathy, his heroism and grandeur, his intensity and limitless passion, his wondrous harmonies that tell of all there is in life and touch the longings and hopes of every heart, has passed from the shores of sound into the realm of silence, borne by the mysterious and restless tide that ever ebbs, but never flows. All moods were his, delicate as the perfume of the first violet, wild as the storm he knew the music of all sounds from the rustle of leaves the whisper of hidden springs to the voices of the sea he was the master of music from the rhythmical strains of irresponsible joy to the sob of the funeral march he stood like a king with his scepter in his hand and we knew that every tone and harmony were in his brain, every passion in his breast, and yet his sculptured face was as calm, as serene, as perfect art. He mingled his soul with the music and gave his heart to the enchanted air. He appeared to have no limitations, no walls, no chains he seemed to follow the pathway of desire and the marvellous melodies the sublime harmonies were as free as eagles above the clouds with outstretched wings he educated refined and gave unspeakable joy to many thousands of his fellow-men he added to the grace and glory of life he spoke a language deeper, more poetic than words. The language of the perfect. The language of love and death. But he is voiceless now. A fountain of harmony has ceased. Its inspired strains have died away in the night, and all its murmuring melodies are strangely still. We will mourn for him, we will honor him, not in words, but in the language that he used. Anton Seidel is dead. Play the great funeral march. Envelop him in music. Let its wailing waves cover him. Let its wild and mournful winds sigh and moan above him. Give his face to its kisses and its tears play the great funeral march music as profound as death that will express our sorrow that will voice our love our hope and that will tell of the life the triumph the genius the death of anton seidel End of section 18. Tribute to Anton Seidel.
Section 19 of Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. 19. A Tribute to Dr. Thomas Seton Robertson. New York, September 8, 1898. In the pulseless hush of death, silence seems more expressive, more appropriate than speech. In the presence of the great mystery, the great mystery that waits to enshroud us all, we feel the uselessness of words. But where a fellow mortal has reached his journey's end, where the darkness from which he emerged has received him again, it is but natural for his friends to mingle with their grief, expressions of their love and loss. He who lies before us in the sleep of death was generous to his fellow men. His hands were always stretched to help, to save. He pitied the friendless, the unfortunate, the hopeless. Proud of his skill, of his success, he was quick to decide, to act, prompt, tireless, forgetful of self. He lengthened life and conquered pain. Hundreds are well and happy now because he lived. This is enough. This puts a star above the gloom of death. He was sensitive to the last degree, quick to feel a slight, to resent a wrong. But in the warmth of kindness, the thorn of hatred blossomed. He was not quite fashioned for this world. The flints and thorns of life's highway bruised and pierced his flesh, and for his wounds he did not have the blessed balm of patience. He felt the manacles, the limitations, the imprisonments of life, and so within the walls and bars he wore his very soul away. He could not bear the storms. The tides, the winds, the waves in the morning of his life dashed his frail bark against the rocks. He fought as best he could, and that he failed was not his fault. He was honest, generous, and courageous. These three great virtues were his. He was a true and steadfast friend, seeing only the goodness of the ones he loved. Only a great and noble heart is capable of this. But he has passed beyond the reach of praise or blame, passed to the realm of rest, to the waveless calm of perfect peace. The storm is spent, the winds are hushed, the waves have died along the shore, the tides are still, the aching heart has ceased to beat. And within the brain, all thoughts, all hopes and fears, Ambitions, memories, rejoicings, and regrets, all images and pictures of the world, of life, are now as though they had not been. And yet hope, the child of love, the deathless beyond the darkness, sees the dawn. And we who knew and loved him, we who now perform the last sad rites, the last that friendship can suggest, we will keep his memory green. Dear friend, farewell. If we do meet again, we shall smile indeed. If not, this parting is well made. Farewell. End of section 19. A tribute to Dr. Thomas Seton Robertson. Section 20 of Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Three Dad. Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. Section 20 A Tribute to Thomas Corwin. Lebanon, Ohio, March 5, 1899. An impromptu preface to Colonel Ingersoll's lecture at Lebanon, Ohio. 
Ladies and gentlemen, being for the first time where Thomas Corwin lived and where his ashes rest, I cannot refrain from saying something of what I feel. Thomas Corwin was a natural orator, armed with the sword of attack and the shield of defense. Nature filled his quiver with perfect arrows. He was the lord of logic and laughter. He had the presence, the pose, the voice, the face that mirrored thoughts, the unconscious gesture of the orator. He had intelligence, a wide horizon, logic as unerring as mathematics, humor as rich as autumn when the boughs and vines bend with the weight of ripened fruit, while the forests flame with scarlet, brown, and gold. He had wit as quick and sharp as lightning, and like the lightning it filled the heavens with sudden light. In his laughter there was logic, in his wit wisdom, and in his humor philosophy and philanthropy. He was a supreme artist. He painted pictures with words. He knew the strength, the velocity of verbs, the color, the light, and shade of adjectives. He was a sculptor in speech changing stones to statues. He had in his heart the sacred something that we call sympathy. He pitied the unfortunate, the oppressed, and the outcast. His words were often wet with tears, tears that in a moment after were glorified by the light of smiles. All moods were his. He knew the heart, its tides and currents, its calms and storms, and like a skillful pilot he sailed emotion's troubled sea. He was neither solemn nor dignified, because he was neither stupid nor egotistic. He was natural, and had the spontaneity of wind and waves. He was the greatest orator of his time, the grandest that ever stood beneath our flag. Reverently, I lay this leaf upon his grave. End of section 20. A tribute to Thomas Corwin. Section 21 of Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. Section 21. A Tribute to Isaac H. Bailey. New York, March 27, 1899. My Friends, when one whom we hold dear has reached the end of life and laid his burden down, it is but natural for us, his friends, to pay the tribute of respect and love, to tell his virtues, to express our sense of loss, and speak above the sculptured clay some word of hope. Our friend, about whose beer we stand, was in the highest, noblest sense a man. He was not born to wealth. He was his own providence, his own teacher. With him work was worship, and labor was his only prayer. He depended on himself, and was as independent as it is possible for man to be. He hated debt, and obligation was a chain that scarred his flesh. He lived a long and useful life. In age, he reaped with joy what he had sown in youth. He did not linger until his flame lacked oil. But with the senses keen, his mind undimmed, and with his arms filled with gathered sheaves, in an instant, painlessly, unconsciously, he passed from happiness and health to the realm of perfect peace. We need not mourn for him, but for ourselves, for those he loved. He was an absolutely honest man, a man who kept his word, who fulfilled his contracts, gave heaped and rounded measure and discharged all obligations with the fabled chivalry of ancient knights. He was absolutely honest, not only with others, but with himself. To his last moment his soul was stainless. He was true to his ideal, true to his thought, and what his brain conceived his lips expressed. He refused to pretend. He knew that to believe without evidence was impossible to the sound and sane, and that to say you believed when you did not, was possible only to the hypocrite or coward. He did not believe in the supernatural. He was a natural man and lived a natural life. He had no fear of fiends. He cared nothing for the guesses of inspired savages, nothing for the threats or promises of the sainted and insane. He enjoyed this life, the good things of this world, 
the clasp and smile of friendship, the exchange of generous deeds, the reasonable gratification of the senses, of the wants of the body and mind. He was neither an insane ascetic nor a fool of pleasure, but walked the golden path along the strip of verdure that lies between the deserts of extremes. With him, to do right was not simply a duty, it was a pleasure. He had philosophy enough to know that the quality of actions depends upon their consequences, and that those consequences are the rewards and punishments that no god can give, inflict, withhold, or pardon. He loved his country. He was proud of the heroic past, dissatisfied with the present, and confident of the future. He stood on the rock of principle. With him the wisest policy was to do right. He would not compromise with wrong. He had no respect for political failures who became reformers and decorated fraud with the pretense of philanthropy, or sought to gain some private end in the name of public good. He despised time-servers, trimmers, fawners, and all sorts and kinds of pretenders. He believed in national honesty, in the preservation of public faith. He believed that the government should discharge every obligation the implied as faithfully as the expressed. And I would be unjust to his memory if I did not say that he believed in honest money, in the best money in the world, in pure gold, and that he despised with all his heart financial frauds, and regarded fifty cents that pretended to be a dollar as he would a thief in the uniform of a policeman, or a criminal in the robe of a judge. He believed in liberty, and liberty for all, he pitied the slave and hated the master. That is to say, he was an honest man. In the dark days of the rebellion, he stood for the right. He loved Lincoln with all his heart, loved him for his genius, his courage, and his goodness. He loved Conkling, loved him for his independence, his manhood, for his unwavering courage, and because he would not bow or bend, loved him because he accepted defeat with the pride of a victor. He loved Grant, and in the temple of his heart, over the altar, in the highest niche, stood the great soldier. Nature was kind to our friend. She gave him the blessed gift of humor. This filled his days with the climate of autumn, so that to him even disaster had its sunny side. On account of his humor, he appreciated and enjoyed the great literature of the world. He loved Shakespeare, his clowns and heroes. He appreciated and enjoyed Dickens. The characters of this great novelist were his acquaintances. He knew them all. Some were his friends, and some he dearly loved. He had wit of the keenest and quickest. The instant the steel of his logic smote the flint of absurdity, the spark glittered. And yet his wit was always kind. The flower went with the thorn. The targets of his wit were not made enemies, but admirers. He was social, and after the feast of serious conversation, he loved the wine of wit, the dessert of a good story that blossomed into mirth. He enjoyed games, was delighted by the relations of chance, the curious combinations of accident. He had the genius of friendship. In his nature there was no suspicion. He could not be poisoned against a friend. The arrows of slander never pierced the shield of his confidence. He demanded demonstration. He defended a friend as he defended himself. Against all comers he stood firm, and he never deserted the field until the friend had fled. I have known many, many friends, have clasped the hands of many that I loved, but in the journey of my life I have never grasped the hand of a better, truer, more unselfish friend than he who lies before us clothed in the perfect peace of death he loved me living and i love him now in youth we front the sun we live in light without a fear without a thought of dusk or night we glory in excess there is no dread of loss when all is growth and gain with reckless hands we spend and waste and chide the flying hours for loitering by the way the future holds the fruit of joy. The present keeps us from the feast, and so, with hurrying feet, we climb the heights and upward look with eager eyes. But when the sun begins to sink and shadows fall in front, 
and lengthen on the path, then falls upon the heart a sense of loss, and then we hoard the shreds and crumbs and vainly long for what we cast away, and then with miser care we save and spread thin hands before December's half-fed flickering flames, while through the glass of time we moaning watch the few remaining grains of sand that hasten to their end. In the gathering gloom the fires slowly die, while memory dreams of youth, and hope sometimes mistakes the glow of ashes for the coming of another morn. But our friend was an exception. He lived in the present. He enjoyed the sunshine of today. Although his feet had touched the limit of fourscore, he had not reached the time to stop, to turn and think about the traveled road. He was still full of life and hope, and had the interest of youth in all the affairs of men. He had no fear of the future, no dread. He was ready for the end. I have often heard him repeat the words of Epicurus. Why should I fear death? If I am, death is not. If death is, I am not. Why should I fear that which cannot exist when I do? If there is, beyond the veil, beyond the night called death, another world to which men carry all the failures and the triumphs of this life, if above and over all there be a God who loves the right, an honest man has naught to fear. If there be another world in which sincerity is a virtue, in which fidelity is loved and courage honored, then all is well with the dear friend whom we have lost. But, if the grave ends all, if all that was our friend is dead, the world is better for the life he lived. Beyond the tomb we cannot see. We listen, but from the lips of mystery there comes no word. Darkness and silence brooding over all. And yet, because we love, we hope. Farewell, and yet again, farewell. And will there sometime be another world? We have our dream, the idea of immortality, that like a sea has ebbed and flowed in the human heart, beating with its countless waves against the sands and rocks of time and fate, was not born of any book or of any creed. It was born of affection. And it will continue to ebb and flow beneath the mists and clouds of doubt and darkness as long as love kisses the lips of death. We have our dream. End of section 21. A tribute to Isaac H. Bailey. Recording by Tom Penn. End of eulogies by Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll.